I want to talk to you about your mission. Talk to you about your mission. And, and if you're wondering, what is my mission? Well, everyone needs to have a mission statement. And uh, our mission statement is already made pretty clear in the Word of God in the Bible. We already have a great commission. It's the very mission that Jesus himself started when he left heaven to come to the earth. And the Bible says the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So he came on a mission. Jesus Christ was the greatest missionary of all time. He didn't cross the seas, cross borders. He crossed from third heaven to first heaven. He crossed the heavens to come here to seek and to save the lost, to pay the price for our salvation. Through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, our salvation has been paid for. Hallelujah. Our healing has been paid for. Every curse has been broken. But that wasn't the end of the mission because as he left, he gave the same mission to the church. Amen. And it's called the Great Commission because it's a cooperative mission. We get to participate in the mission. Jesus said, I go on to my Father. The same things I have done, you will do also. And even greater works than these you shall do. And he said, it's better for you that I go away. Because when I do leave, I will send you another comforter, the mighty Holy Ghost, the third person of the Godhead, who will come upon you. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you shall receive power to be my witnesses. And he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples of all nations. Teach them the things that I've taught you. And then he said, these signs shall follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it shall not by any means harm them. Amen. And then you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And the Bible says in Mark 16, they went about preaching the gospel, preaching the word of God. And the Lord was working with them. Confirming the word with signs following. So we're not working for God. Amen. We're not working for Jesus. Jesus is not working for us. We are working together in this great commission. And that is the primary mission of the church. So I'm going to speak to you about understanding your mission. Now the mission of River Church in West Palm Beach is threefold. And this is something we always talk about in our membership class is to bring revival to the church and, the mo and mobilize the body of Christ to labor in the harvest fields and bring in the end time harvest of souls. We are a soul winning church. What good is it to come here in, within the four walls of the church, get touched by the power of God and do nothing with it? We are to receive the power and then we are to go out with the power to the highways and the byways and compel the lost to come in to preach the gospel with signs following. That's why you, every Sunday morning here at the main event, you hear the testimonies. This week again, 496 souls saved here in this area. Last year, our goal was 12,000. We, we led 12,221 people to the Lord on the streets and halfway houses and, and uh, nursing homes and, and hospitals and schools and many, many places that we've go to. Amen. And we're preaching the gospel. We've got teams. We're mobilizing people. You get the fire of God here on your tail, and then you're moving with the fire into the harvest field. Amen. Amen. Samson caught 300 foxes, tied their tails together, and set their tails on fire. I can guarantee you those 300 foxes were not sitting around saying, hey, let's have a nice conference about having our tails tied together. You know, when the fire was on their tail, they moved. They moved with a sense of urgency. Come on, camera, get my tail. There you go. They moved with a sense of urgency. Hallelujah. They, they moved with a sense of urgency. And the Bible says they ran into the harvest field. They ran into the field of the enemy. That's where we're going. We're going into the field of the enemy to snatch souls out of the jaws of hell in the name of Jesus. Amen. So... This, the mission of this church is the mission of the kingdom. Even though we are a local church, we have taken personally and taken ownership of the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
that we as the church must preach the gospel and go into the harvest fields. That is our primary mission. So if you're looking to, and, and to see what your mission is and wondering what your mission is, and as the same thing I was telling you, you might be a, a, a prophet, but your mission is still to bring the lost, to reach the lost at any cost. Amen. All the fivefold ministry gifts are there to edify the church, equip the saints for the work of the ministry. But as you have the opportunity, we are not only to minister to the church, but we are also to mobilize the church to touch and impact the world. If we're not doing that and we're just stuck in the four walls of the church, then we're just a little club. That's why, you know, we never lack for visitors on any given Sunday or any service here at the church because we're constantly going after souls. We never lack for visitors. There's never been one single service where there's not been a new visitor, someone new coming to our church because we are always going after souls. And there's always new people moving into the area. And the second mission of the church is to equip believers with the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, we have been given the Word and the Spirit. Those two are working together. The Word and the Spirit are in agreement. You know, you have to have both. You'll go to some places, all you get is the Word. That's why people dry up. You go to other places, all they want is just the Spirit. They blow up. But the Word and the Spirit working together, you'll grow up. Amen. When it's time to praise, you'll lift up. When it's time to give, you'll give up. When it's time to go, you'll go up. Hallelujah. It's, it's important to understand. That's why this church is about the Spirit and the Word. Not only the move of the Spirit, but there has to be solid preaching and teaching of the Word to equip believers. Hallelujah. Why do we do that? So that they can be fruitful in their divine callings. They can be fruitful in their divine callings. Now, we have to understand when it comes to having, your, having a vision and mission for your life, a big part of that, I'm, I'm going to tell you, 80% of, of the vision and mission for your life is already written. Because 80% of the will of God is already written. It's known. It is the written will of God. It is God's written will and testament. Somebody has to die for the will to be read. Jesus left us, left us his will, which is his testament. The New Testament, which is a better covenant, better testament than the old one. Because now we can be baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. Every believer can be baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire and carry the power of God. And to do mighty things for the kingdom. So 80% of the vision and the mission for your life is already written. So you've got to take that and you've got to get involved with the mission of the church. Amen. Jesus gave us that great commission, which is the mission of the church, the greater church, the global church. However, we know that we can't have every believer gathered together in one place at one time. That's impossible. Not, all, not as long as we're on the planet. When we get off the planet, we will have the greatest church service of all time. Saints of all ages will be gathered together to meet the Lord in the air. And then we'll have literally Millions upon millions upon millions, a billion plus billions of believers gathered together in one big giant church service before the throne of God. Singing together. And you're going to sing in perfect tune. The temperature, the lighting, everything, the music, everything will be perfect. And we'll worship before the throne of God. But until that happens, we have to meet in local churches. That's what this place is. This is a local church, but with a global mission. Why? Because we have been given a global mission. And we want to see everyone here be fruitful in their divine callings. And that requires people being equipped. Being equipped. And so... Not only are the services designed to equip believers, but we have the River School of Ministry to help equip, amen, equip people in their callings. We have Discipleship School on Wednesdays. We have 
men's groups and women's group. What, what a great men's, men's ministry we had. Men of valor. I mean, amazing stuff. Learning how to lead in tough times. And the women are learning amazing things. I mean, they're, they're just killing kryptonite. Anything that will hinder their lives, getting burnt out of them, you know, and, and the youth ministry. So these are all designed to equip, gather, build community, and equip. And now we're launching River Christian Academy. Where we're going to be equipping K through 12 in a very unique out of the box, out of the box. And we're going to have interest meetings concerning that here in the next few weeks. And we already have, I believe, 22 or 25 uh, students that are interested. I mean, this is going to be a completely out of the box school. We want to take them young and pour the Holy Ghost into them. And, and they're not going to have a bunch of useless information they're going to memorize and do nothing with. We want to discover, we want to help them discover their giftings and callings at a young age. And so into that, pour into that, training up a child in the way they should go. The school system is completely broken. Absolutely, completely broken. And by design, the public school system is broken. And even many so-called Christian schools and private schools are broken. And we've got to put the word and the fire in the kids. And then we're going to have what we call STEAM. Science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And these are the, the things. And, and if their calling is in one area, let's focus in that area. Let, let's not have them waste their time with a bunch of other stuff. I mean, everybody needs to have basic math, basic this. But then they need to become experts. Major in the majors. Minor in the minors. You know. And the whole pu public school system and even the others are designed to just train students to take a standardized test. They have no critical thinking skills. They don't know how to solve problems. I mean, and, and they don't even know what to do once they get out. And then they just told, hey, just go to college. Well, the whole college is a part of the banking system. Now you're going to go to college. You're going to get, you're going to graduate with 100, 150, 200, 250,000 dollars worth of student loans. And then now you got to pay that for the rest of your life. I call that modern day slavery. And then all these kids, they cannot rise up and to do anything with vision. And I'm, I mean, listen, I went to college and I do encourage if you call into a, a specialty area, college may be right for you. But I tell kids now, just graduating high school, learn a trade and start your own company and business. <laughs> Hallelujah. By the time those people get out in four or five years, six years, from some party school where they didn't learn anything and they got a useless degree in underwater basket weaving or gender studies or social studies or some nonsense that they can't even get a job and now they're in, up to their eyeballs in debt, they can't do anything. It's a system of debt that's designed to create a working class that's going to pay off debt for the rest of their lives. We want people to be financially free free to fulfill the mission that God has for their lives. This is all out of the box. I mean, it shouldn't be, but nowadays it is because everything's been put in a box and the church has been put in a box. We're an out of the box church. And the way we want to equip even the young ones, start them young. And if you, if you go to our kids ministry, you'll see the kids are under the anointing, speaking in tongues at four, five, six years of age. They're not coloring, uh, you know, Noah's Ark. <laughs> They're being trained to be ministers. Hallelujah. And the third mission of this church is to plant other churches and raise up Ephesians 4.11, fivefold ministry offices in the body of Christ. You know, my wife and I have been a part of close to 30 church plants. You heard about the church in Kinshasa. It's, it's growing. River in Kinshasa. That's been going almost 10 years. You know, we have many Congolese in our church in Istanbul. Many Africans. Congolese. You know, that's a francophone. That's a French-speaking nation. And they have been thrown. And Congo actually is, the, if not the wealthiest, one of the top three wealthiest nations on the planet in terms of natural resources. But yet it's one of the poorest nations. Why? Because wars, 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 
Wars to divide, conquer. Wars to divide and conquer. Why the elite can steal all the gold, the diamonds and everything and, and rape the nation of the natural resources. And people have been, have been leaving the country, trying to go to Europe, looking for a better place. And that's what happened with Didier. Didier Kalambay. He came to Istanbul, Turkey. He was, he had, he was, I think he paid or he was about to pay $2,000 to smugglers to smuggle him across the border from Tur Turkey into Greece. And once you could get into Greece, into the European Union, this was sometime maybe 2003 or four, something like that, um, five, I don't know. But, you know, and then maybe just make your way down to France or Belgium because, you know, grass is greener on the other side. And then he came to Istanbul, Turkey, and God got a hold of him. The power of God hit him, smacked him, and he stayed, and he went through our Bible school. Then he came and became, you know, he became a part of our French ministry, leading worship, and then actually helping, you know, pastor, shepherd the people. And then one day he comes to me and says, I'm going back to Congo, pastor. I really feel the call of God to go plant a church. We blessed him. We sent him back. Been there almost a little over 10 years now. They're building a facility, a building and, um, you know, and running about 600 people and just growing. But that all come, came out of our Bible school of equipping people. And, and you want to talk about a Jonah. You know, he was on a boat to Belgium, <laughs> Whatever, wherever he was going. But the Lord turned everything around, you know, because many people are out of the will of God because they're just functioning under mammon's economy. But once you get involved with the kingdom, hallelujah. hallelujah. And then he went back there. He found a wife. He's got kids now and a prospering church, growing church. You know, so that's, that's a part of the mission. And we're going to be planting many other churches. The Lord told me that go to West Palm Beach, that base, there'll be 30 more churches you'll plant out of this base. Now, some things take time. You know, we're not rushing into anything because it's not about just getting a building and having a meeting. It's about having the people. So that's where we're investing in people. And, um, and if, you're, if you're patient and, and um, you know, yield to the process, the Lord will do a work in you and you'll be ready and you'll be prepared. When you're ready and prepared, we'll, we'll talk. We'll work things out. But many people, they just jump ahead of God, run ahead of God, and jump out there to, do, to trying to do their own thing, and we can't cover them. And I said, listen, you know, do whatever. I don't tell people what to do, but you know, here's how you do the things the right way. And if you do things the right way, it'll, it'll prosper. And you won't be a flash in the pan. You won't be a shooting star. You'll actually, you'll actually um, have fruit that will remain. And we want to see other people raised up evangelists, others, prophets, pastors, teachers, apostles raised up out of this place. Hey, if you go and do, do twice as much as I do, praise the Lord. I'm happy. I, I'll share. I'll get the rewards anyways. I'm not in competition with anybody. So to accomplish the mandate given to our local church, we have the following three priorities in everything we do. Evangelism always comes first. We got to go after souls. Secondly, equipping, equipping believers, equip, equipping people. Thirdly, establishing ministries, launching ministries, and that's very important. Hallelujah. So um, when it comes to the church and its mission, we have to understand the mission. And in the church, we have three major priorities that we have to establish our lives around. Our Christian life cannot be complete without all three of these priorities active in our lives. And in order of priority, they are, first and foremost, everything begins with a personal commitment to Jesus Christ and His Lordship. That's the first commitment you make. You make a commitment to Jesus Christ. Make Him the Lord of your life. You commit your life to Him. That's what it means to be saved, to be born again, to make a decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. That's the first commitment you have to make. And I know commitment, the word commitment has become sort of an ugly word these days. I did not cuss in church. You would think that I cussed when I said commitment because we are living in a very, a society that is very non-committal. People don't want to commit anymore. They don't want to commit to anything. They don't want to commit to relationships. They don't want to commit to marriage. They don't even want to commit to their children. They don't want to commit to the church. We are living in a society where there is 
com being committed, commitment seems that because the enemy, the devil has told people that commitment is bondage. No, commitment is freedom. Right? Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. When you commit your life to Jesus, that's when you experience true freedom. Amen. So there has to be that first and foremost, a personal commitment to Jesus Christ. Secondly, there has to be commitment to the body of Christ in a local church. Immediately after making that personal commitment, there has to be that second commitment. Now we get a lot of people saved. That's for sure. Now you may question whether those people are being saved or not. I don't question anything. Sometimes the people that seems the most unsaved actually are saved and the people that seem most saved are unsaved. So I've stopped questioning that a long time ago. I'll leave that in the hands of God. Our job is to preach the gospel, bring people to a decision point and thousands and thousands of people pray with us on the streets. They pray with us here at the altar calls. I mean, we do what we can to bring them to that place of personal commitment. But then there is that second step of commitment. Now that you made a commitment to Jesus Christ, you got to make a commitment to the body of Christ. Because as a believer, as a Christian, you cannot be outside of the body of Christ. You are part of a body. You're part of a family. And you have to find your place in the body of Christ. And in order for you to do that, you have to be part of a local body. You know, you can't be a spiritual grasshopper. Jump from church to church to church. You can't be a spiritual butterfly. Float here, float there. We got a lot of people like that because we are, in, we are living in very critical times. You know, about 10 years ago, statistically speaking, for the first time in the history of the United States of America, statistically speaking, according to surveys, the percentage of unchurched believers or Christians or people who call themselves believers and Christians, percentage of unchurched Christians surpassed the percentage of churched Christians. That means there are actually more Christians not in church this Sunday morning than those that are in church here in the United States of America. And that is a, a tragedy and that, that is showing us why our nation is in the condition that is, it is in. Now I do understand that the blame is not all, all on the people either. The blame is also on leadership in many ways because they have forsaken the Holy Ghost, right? You know, my, my people have committed two evils, two evils. They have forsaken, right? They have, they have hewed for themselves, what? Cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So you got the whole church structure that just leaks out. There's no presence. There's no anointing. There's no life-changing power of God that is truly free to move in people's lives. And then they have forsaken the fountain of living waters, the Holy Ghost. So, you know, in America, you know, we've really developed the whole way of doing church without the Holy Ghost. You can pack out buildings without the Holy Ghost. So this is the challenge that we're facing and that's the challenge we face as a church because we just not going to compromise the move of the Spirit. And I understand this is not, this church is not for everybody. If you're looking for the one hour dry cleaning service, you know, a 15 minute set list of songs, a 25 minute little self-help message by a life coach, and then eat popcorn and cotton candy and go hang out. You, you, know, you, you spend one hour in the service, but three hours at the coffee shop. That's church in America for you. And then as we come into the summer, we'll have, we'll have church at the movies. Disney and Marvel and DC Comics on a Sunday morning. And in some places you go and the guy's on a screen a thousand miles away. No laying on of hands, no speaking in tongues, no prophecy, no gifts of the Spirit, because he might offend the seekers. We call the seeker-friendly movement. The biggest curse on the American church. I'll come out and say it right now. I have absolutely no problem saying it. The biggest curse on the American church has been the seeker-friendly movement. And most people don't even know that it was funded by the globalists back in the late 80s, early 90s. When they formed the Leadership Network, and Rockefeller Foundation begin to fund pastors coming to the leadership network and they made it all about marketing and leadership that they could build churches large churches by marketing and leadership principles and skills and they were taught by leadership gurus that were not even saved I have studied the whole thing out I know everything about it I'm a history buff I know everything about it it was a counter revival movement
So we are not a secret family church. You can see we're still going. Somebody's looking at, oh my God, it's almost been going three hours. We seek the Holy Ghost, and we are a Holy Ghost-friendly church. And that's the challenge of building a church like this in America. I understand, you know. But we're going to stick to what God's given us to do. So there has to be a commitment to the body of Christ in a local church. You've got to get planted in the house of the Lord. Those who are planted shall flourish. Those who are planted in the courts of our God shall flourish. And that's why many Christians don't flourish because they're never planted. Or they're always being uprooted. You know, when, when we were doing some, uh, planting some things in our garden, my wife had a, um, you know, a landscaper, um, you know, and then um, a guy that does all, and then she had a, a tree planted in one area and she wanted to move it. She said, to him, can we move it? And I was there, you know, usually she's, you know, very much into that. And I'm into not gardens, but guns, another type of G, but you know, but I was there. And then she said, could we move this tree from here? He said, we can't, we can't move it now. It'll die. We just planted it. We can't just uproot it and move it in another place. It will not survive. And no wonder why many Christians never truly survive the storms of life and never really break through and grow because they're just constantly being uprooted and planted, uprooted and planted. They go from here to there to there and they never put their roots down. Your roots, you got to have to have, and you know, hey, you know, if you don't have a good strong root system here in, the, in Florida, a hurricane will come and, and blow you right away uh, to the other side of the city. You got to have strong roots. You got to have strong roots and that, that means being in a local church. Planted, and that's what church membership is. It's not a certificate. It's not a club membership. This is not Costco membership. Cancel anytime you get your money back. This ain't no subscription service because that's how the world. I know we're used to that here in America. Everything is, you know, 90 days free cancellation, whatever. Buy now, pay later. You know, all that kind of stuff. That's how it's. Kind of, people are conditioned, you know, in their thinking, unfortunately, and they approach church kind of the same way. You know, and then, or, or they'll go on Yelp or Facebook or whatever and, and, and give a rating. Go on there and give us a five star rating if you believe a five star church. Go rate, I don't care, but people look at that, so rate. Go give us a five star rating. Because people look at that. I couldn't care less. But I mean, you know, that's what other people look at. But that's kind of what they're used to now, you know. And then they, and they come and they rate the service. Mm. I'll give that service on a scale of one to ten. I'll give it a four. Last Sunday was more like an eight, and today is more like a four, you know. And but can we rate you, maybe? Uh, your attitude was about an eight last Sunday. This, this Sunday, your attitude is about a two, you know. What, what if we could take a a thermometer and kind of stick it in people's spirit to get their spiritual temperature, you know. Is it, are they hot? On fire? Or is it lukewarm? Ew, yuck. Or, or is it cold? You know, frozen, chosen. Yeah, I mean, so, it, it, and God's rating us as well. He does. He, he wants to he, he'll test you and prove you and see if you're worthy, right? And see if you know, uh, come on somebody, don't, don't shout me down now, I'm preaching good. And then the third commitment, so once you made a commitment to the body of Christ in a local church, and that's really what church membership is, it's a covenant relationship. Thirdly, you have to make a commitment to the work of Christ. In the world. So personal commitment to Jesus Christ, commitment to the body of Christ, and then commitment to the work of Christ in the world, our evangelism and missions. I mean, we have a work to do. God has given us a work to do, and our work is not to come and fill a seat on a Sunday morning. Man, I, I, I did my work today. I, I took up a seat for three hours, 
and we think we did God a favor. We have a work to do, and that means serve the kingdom of God, work in the church, serve in the helps ministry, serve in the kids' church, serve in the various areas where we need that we serve God's people, and then we serve and we do the work. We go into the world and we do the work. We, do, we evangelize, we reach souls, we bring them in. Every one of you need to be not only a soul winner, but you need to bring somebody to church every Sunday. Don't just bring yourself, but every Sunday have a goal to bring somebody with you. Amen. And, and make a commitment to the work of Christ. And then eventually God will raise people up to do in, in full-time ministry. But maybe your ministry will be in the realm of business. God will anoint you for business. And that'll be your work to do out in the marketplace. To represent the kingdom of God in the marketplace. Build a kingdom business. Amen. And then do marketplace evangelism. Reach people that we could never reach. Hallelujah. Reach people where they are. Maybe you're a school teacher. You're going to reach the kids. Maybe, maybe you're out there you know, in sales. And, and you're going to knock on somebody's door. And, and then... Isn't that right, Ernesto? Somebody came and knocked on your door trying to sell you solar, solar panels for your house and then led you to the Lord and then he ended up coming to church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Last year, about a year ago, somebody came and knocked on your door. There, Marsha, right? We were doing the students were doing a, a student crusade. We brought the tent out there to Tavares Co. And you guys were there looking for a church and praying actually. And somebody came and knocked on your door. And then said, Yep, that's our church. So, I mean, think about that. And today she's becoming a member. And so is Ernesto. So, so we are here to be an agency of God for evangelizing the world. And we're here to be a corporate body in which man may, may worship God. So we have our ministry together to the Lord. And then we have our ministry together to the world. And out of our ministry to the Lord comes the, our ministry to the world. That's what you see in Acts chapter 13. It says there were prophets and teachers in the church in Antioch. And they were fasting and praying and ministering to the Lord. As they were ministering to the Lord, the Holy Spirit speaks to them and said, set apart for me. Saul and Barnabas for the work which I have called them to do. And the Bible says when they fasted and prayed more, they laid their hands on them and they sent them out. They sent them out. So there's going to be many, many things. But as we minister to the Lord, then happens our ministry to the world. Amen.